Well, welcome to the Imperial War Museum's series on reimagining victory. And this one is about healing from war. It's about the whole process of trying to make peace when the fighting starts, if and when, of course, it starts because of, you know, some of the conflicts that we're seeing in the world at the moment seem pretty never ending. Um, this is under the auspices of the IWM Institute, which is there to um, deepen the public understanding of war and conflict, partnered by the peace building NGO, conciliation resources. And all this is, of course, marking the 75th anniversary of VE Day, which in a way, the aftermath of the Second World War eventually was perhaps a good example of peace building. Maybe we can even talk a little bit about that. But first of all, let's um, just I'll very briefly introduce our speakers. First of all, uh, Wala Khatib, Syrian journalist, filmmaker, activist, uh, has made a celebrated, quite rightly, documentary for summer. It's nominated for four BAFTAs. Uh, it's also it won for Best Documentary, it was also um, nominated for the Academy Award for the Best Documentary Feature. Simon Wesley, Regis Professor of Psychiatry at the Maudsley Hospital in King's College London. He founded the King Centre for Mental Health Research, whose work focuses on the health of British Armed Forces, past and present, on combat stress, cohesion, a morale and physical and mental injury. He's a civilian consultant advisor in psychiatry to the British Army and making visits to war zones, Iraq, Afghanistan. And uh, last but not least of those um, illustrious threesome we have here today, Rachel Clogg, senior advisor at Conciliation Resources, which is a London-based international organization and NGO committed to stopping violent conflict and creating more peaceful societies for 20 years. She's led the development of conciliations resources work in the South Caucasus. And I'm Jeremy Bowen. I'm the Middle East editor of the BBC. And in the course of my um, many years in journalism, I've been in many conflicts, some of which have sort of got resolved, other ones haven't. Uh, spent a lot of time in Syria in the last few years, and I'm interested to see your, um, Rachel, your CV as well um, in the Caucasus, because I was in uh, Grozny in the winter of 94, uh, 95, which I'd say was probably the most violent place of all the 20 wars I've been to. I suppose Syria matches it, but Grozny was pretty horrendous. Let's, first of all, we're going to talk to about a few things, but first of all, let's talk a bit about building peace. Uh, but first of all, the, the war in Syria has changed, but it's going on. What do you think the prospects of peace in your country are? Uh, I'm afraid that it's justice and only justice. And that's what we feel it's like very far from now. It's very important for us for this to stop, but like, in one way or another, we when when you think about how it should stop, you know, like it's all about the crime that was committed by Assad regime, the Russian forces, and so many other uh, actors who were uh, on the ground. But at the same time, you know, like we can't stop thinking about like next, how we can think about next if we didn't find some justice. There is no peace at all without justice. You talked about the importance of justice in Syria, and what you've you know the the undoubted crimes that have been committed there uh, by the Assad regime but the Assad regime is winning the war so since justice so often after conflicts is victor's justice victor's justice for the Assad regime is not going to include the Assad regime is it uh i don't think like Assad won the war, as you you mentioned, like I know that so many people are saying about this, but like what he really won. If we just look at Syria as country about the uh, like the interference in Syria by now, like if you walked in any street in Syria, you can't not see like Russian forces, uh, Iran militias, Hezbollah militia and these people who are the real people who are con like controlling the country. Uh, the economy, uh, if you look about, at that now, like it's just going crazy how much the, our our uh, Syrian lira are like just getting down. 
if you looked about uh, the prisons, people who are disappeared, people, uh, the destruction that we have in Syria. I don't, I don't know, you know, what winning are we talking about if we want to mention this in, in really, in really good way. No, it's, I agree. It's a very tarnished, incomplete victory, and of course there are. There's another eruption of um, dissent and demonstrations against the regime going on in southern Syria exactly. even now. So it's far, far yeah, from. Yeah, you know, like That's... this. This mention just of this demonstration means that he didn't win anything. He just even he didn't even like convince the people who are living under his control that that's really good for them. And that's what gives me like now hope that, yeah, whatever it's happening and I don't know when we could find kind of justice, but I, I'm sure this is will happen one day when I'm seeing these people who are there risking their life after nine years of knowing exactly what does that mean to stand against the regime and they still going out demanding freedom and dignity and state of law. Uh, Rachel, let's talk a little bit about frozen conflict. You've had a you've worked a lot on that sort of thing in Eastern Europe, in uh, in the Caucasus, Central Asia as well. Uh, and there are some conflicts which just seem to be going on and on and on. And even when they notionally end, and I'm thinking of the conflict in former Yugoslavia, years after the, the guns fall silent, it's as if the front lines have been frozen, sometimes in people's heads, but sometimes in reality as well. How do you ungum all of that? I I think with great, great difficulty. I mean, I, I slightly resist the term frozen conflict because actually, as you say, the guns fall silent, the, the conflict continues to evolve and, and the dynamics are slow. There's not the active violence that, that there was. But um, but as as time goes on, the, the problems that were there that led to violence in the first place, they compound and they, they are added to by layers of grief and trauma and, and, and injustice that comes from, from violence itself. And, and, and so you end up with this uh, real stuckness that you, you can't get to resolution. Uh, before you can get to resolution, it's very, very difficult to start working on the, the broken relationships that are fundamental to, to repairing in order to get to some point of, of uh, where, where you can even imagine moving from a, a, a mindset of you or I to, to you and I and some kind of shared future. So how how you unstick it? I mean, I've, I've been involved actually in the Caucasus since uh, the, the very beginning of the, the wars there that accompanied the, um, the collapse of the Soviet Union and seeing Myself, I had friends there, and and through their eyes, the descent into chaos and 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 violence, and then coming out the other end of that. Um, in those early years, there was a sense uh, on the, the the side that ostensibly won the war, that that they were going to get somewhere. But but I think it's an indication that political aspirations are very rarely achieved through war. And and here we are, 25 years later. And we're starting now to work with an entirely new generation of, of people who are inheriting a lot of the legacy and the trauma and, and are now um, uh, still, still living that conflict. Um, you, you know, talking about different generations and generations moving on or not moving on, one thing that strikes me is that w when the, the wars of former Yugoslavia started back in, in 1991, I spent a lot of time there, uh, in the very beginning, you would hear young guys talking about things that had happened to their grandparents or even their parents, talking about the Second World War, atrocities that the, the Croats had vested on the Serbs and vice versa. And then I found that after a year or so, they had their own atrocities to talk about. Uh, so these things, you know, they, they, they live on, don't they? They do. They perpetuate. and and injustice until it's really dealt with at its at its core and until you confront these legacies of, of layers and layers of generational trauma I, I think it's very hard uh, and it takes an extraordinary in, individual in a way to be able to see through that and then to engage with their impo a, a opponent as a, a on a human level absolutely Simon um, as a someone who spent a career studying what's going inside people's heads in this particular 
field, how do you change that mindset? Because to, to take part in the war, either as a direct competent or as someone whose life is being turned upside down, destroyed, changed forever by what's going on, that, that molds people, doesn't it? And how do, you, how do they move on from that? Well, it depends on what we're talking about here. I mean, you said I, I'm a psychiatrist, that's correct, but I've also spent most of my career uh, looking at the problems of soldiers returning from all this. So that's a specific thing. And of course, that 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 kind of narrative goes right back to the beginning of, of the kind of Western canon with the Odyssey and the Iliad. And, it, and it's a fascinating area that we do. And it works quite well in, in understanding veterans coming home. Um, you've mentioned already this is the 75th anniversary of VE Day and the end of the Second World War. And we can see in the literature of the First World War, the Second World War, et cetera, this theme of the soldier from the war returning is a strong one with its difficulties, with its problems, with its psychological aftermath and so on. But if you go back to the 1945 and you remember that, that the Second World War wasn't just that, it was also a series of civil wars and most wars are civil wars and most wars that we've just been talking about now are civil wars. And these are rather different and the countries that continue to have difficulties with um, the competence of, the, of that period, um, with the civilians of that period, et cetera, are those in which the Second War was much more a civil war. You've already mentioned former Yugoslavia. We could talk about the, the bloodlands of Galicia between Poland, Ukraine, and the Belarus. Um, I've just come back from Lithuania, the, the last flight I took just before um, we all went into reversal, as it were, was at a conference on healing the trauma of war from Lithuania. And, and these are very, very difficult. And those are where we, we, we seem to have started from. Uh, and, and in which, it, when we move into kind of discussions of truth and reconciliation and whatever, but there, it's not the kind of work we do with individuals who have developed what we now call PTSD, but has gone through various different disorders over the years with different things and, and different um, outcomes and symptoms, but nevertheless, something very coherent we can get a grip on to where we're talking about healing populations, which is infinitely more difficult um, and in which my kind of job is only a small part. Um, politicians uh, and leaders, etc., play a much larger role. In a way, it's much more interesting, but it, it's also phenomenally difficult. And no doubt we'll start talking about truth and reconciliation and um, <clears throat> how that works and indeed how it doesn't work. But we just need to remember the narratives of the veteran tends to come from distant wars like Iraq, Afghanistan, etc. But the complex ones are those of civil wars. And what's just happened in the USA very recently is a perfect example of that. They've had no trouble getting over the First World War. Most of them don't remember they were in it. The Second World War creates the narrative of the golden generation. But what is still bringing people out on the streets is the American Civil War, still unresolved still a major source of conflict. Um, well, should we just talk a little bit about your particular experiences? Because you have received uh, international acclaim as a filmmaker, um, but most people who go off to make films in war zones don't come from those war zones. It doesn't really affect their lives, except tangentially, perhaps, as part of the consequences of that. But there's someone like me who arrive, and they do their job, and then they go home. Uh, different thing for you because that film was about and what you were doing was about your life and your town your city and now you are a, a refugee from war yourself uh give us an idea of how what it's like how does that feel so um to be very honest like when i start filming and like just recording my daily life and following some people when we were inside Aleppo. We've never thought that this is, will be like last for 10 years so far. Um, and who knows like how long it will be even more. But for me, like I wasn't a filmmaker. I was just a woman from that community who decided to film and document because I felt that was the only thing I can do in that situation. Uh, so like being filmmaker, this is something happened after I started like filming. And for me, like living through this, it was something um, like I've never, of course, like imagined about this before, but we knew exactly and we were very aware uh, about the risk that we were putting ourselves in. 
and we were kind of like fine with that. Uh, the difficulties and sometimes when you start like to to see that maybe like death could be something very small and we you wish sometimes if like you could be killed and this could be something like easier for any other options you had in front of your eyes. But the shocking things for me and thing that I I've never be able like to to face or to uh, really understand uh, the fact that we left. Um, I know for so many people it seems like very easy and that's the obvious decision that you should leave. But we forced to flee and we were like displaced out. And for me, even after five years of living through that experience, now after like after these five years, there's three years of working on the film, and now almost one year just like to screen the film around and watch this. I feel that I'm like I'm okay to watch everything we went through, but not the moment when we knew that we had to leave. Um, I know that like what Dr. Simon now is talking about is something like I should face one day and I should like start just like to process what I went through. But so far as this is still going on, I feel like I'm not in the position of really stand and like just feeling this. I'm focusing more now on continuing my role, trying to like keep this struggle going on and find my way of just being busy in some stuff and finding a uh, meaning or the point why I'm still alive until today. Do, do, you, feel, do, do you feel guilty about not being in Aleppo? Yeah. yeah, of course, yes. I mean, it's not about Aleppo specifically because I can't be in Aleppo now, but I feel now I should be in Idlib. And this kind of feeling, I don't want to like not feel that because I feel in one way or another, I've changed as a person if I didn't feel that guilt. Um, I think just like the main thing about this, that we have so much responsibility and we have so much uh, just feeling of, uh, as you just mentioned, like some people say a sad one. And when we knew what we went through, when we knew that this is not just something we can like ignore or forget, we need to keep going until we find that day of not even achieving justice, but starting this process of justice. Rachel, in terms of uh, of trying to build peace after a conflict or when a conflict is in its winding down phase or changing or or going on to something that's longer lasting but more le low level, less intense, uh, how, what's your experience of trying to see the way people's minds work in terms of trying to adapt themselves to to what's happened? I think in a way it comes back to this question about justice and that there needs to be truth seeking, there needs to be some form of, of redress for victims, but I'd question how far justice can be achieved. And I've seen, um, I mean, you, you have the, the, the mechanisms, certainly in, in conflicts where there has been some form of settlement, the international criminal courts or, or other forms of, of kind of legal justice uh, meted out but but these mechanisms are, uh, are often flawed they they don't include everyone and and i do question how much the the sort of punitive forms of redress or accountability um really leave victims better off and just hearing ward's story now of of displacement i've worked with um, displaced uh, communities for 25 years now and i remember watching films together with uh, Georgians who were displaced from Abkhazia and the, the, the film would pan out to the sea and there would just be a collective gasp in the room when you see this emblematic image of the home that, that they cannot get back to and talking to uh, one of the, my uh, colleagues after that, one, one of the women watching this film, she said to me, I've, I've understood for myself that while for me justice is to return, I can't, I can't see that happening in my lifetime and certainly not if we're going to avoid more violence. And so I have had to reconcile within myself that I will not see justice done. And I think this, this is the sort of thing that, that individuals are having to grapple with and, and groups uh, 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 that makes it extremely um, 
difficult but 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 Im impressive that they're that they're able somehow to to process this and then then i think it's a question of time you know it really does take time after the violence for people to be able to start to talk in that way to start to even be able to see that there are different narratives there are different perspectives we're a long long way in the context that i work in from a shared narrative uh, and, and even to introduce some complexity into the narratives or some diverse perspectives is is already a, a, a major achievement. So I think it, it's it's a messy business. I don't know how much uh, justice can really be done after war, and it's certainly not possible to get back to where you started from. So so in, sorry. No, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I beg your pardon. I was just going to uh, pick up on something you said, Rachel, and I'll put, put it to Simon, and that's the idea of um, some kind of of justice, a legal process, perhaps, in terms of dealing with some of those, <clears throat> excuse me, those psychological legacies that you were you were talking about. I'm thinking perhaps of the uh, the war crimes tribunal in the former Yugoslavia, uh, a process that went on for quite a few years. They gathered enormous amounts of detail about what had happened and gave people the chance to come on as witnesses and tell their stories and see the perpetrators in the dock. Um, I'm, I was a witness in four separate trials there. Um, do, do you think that that process of seeing across a room your former tormentors or the people responsible for that torment and talking about what happened to you, is that is that therapeutic in any sense or is it actually perhaps even potentially damaging well excellent questions because of course it can be both we know from the um experience of of the german war crime trials in the 1960s that that certainly didn't help the uh, victims at all um because of the attitude of the perpetrators a complete unwillingness to confront uh, the past and many of, of the people who came to testify left more traumatized than they had been before but we know where we also know where there is genuine uh, truth genuine truth and an acceptance of, of, of the past it can be cathartic and sometimes it can't and the best example i know and i have to say this is i'm, I'm i do big studies i'm an epidemiologist i don't get out of bed for less than two thousand people and we do big trials and we you know, we actually can randomize soldiers in, in war zones to different treatments to see which worked but the quite brilliant study was done in sierra leone only a few years ago um, after the hideous truly hideous civil war if you've been out there you would know and i'm sure you have you know where a lot of the children are named tony after tony blair and that isn't an act of irony it's because he's regarded as, as helping bring it to an end but they had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission going, and, and not just on, on the big political level, but in the villages, uh, right through Sierra Leone. And, and some genius uh, randomized them. So there were about 2,000 villagers, and 1,000 went through a Truth and Re Reconciliation procedure. It was, sorry, it was 200. Um, it was in the year 2000, it was 200. And, and the other half did it. And what they showed was, indeed, there was catharsis there was more healing there was more forgiveness of the perpetrators there was an increase in social networks and an increase in social capital which is good but those who had been victims and had testified ended up both more depressed more anxious and had more post-traumatic stress disorder three years later so on the macro level things had improved and the society was indeed able to go forward but the act of reconciliation and forgiveness had actually done psychological harm to those who had testified and i think that's why we find such difficulties in you know knowing quite what we do do here because the capacity to do harm and good exists in parallel and so there was political good but personal harm and, and um, it's an amazing study it was in the journal science the top world's top journal for science and the first time anything like that had ever been in there and, and deserves to be better known. It was published in 2016 uh, and just shows how difficult this is. We also know, if you, you know, you're expecting me to say better out than in, it's good to talk, and but it isn't always. There are all sorts of ways of dealing with these things. The generation of the Second World War didn't really feel that quite as much as we do. Um, and the 
Russians of the, of the Great Patriotic War, if you read Kathy Meridale's um, Knight of Stone, they clearly didn't. They clearly believed in Stoicism. They had a much more political sense of what they'd done and, res and refused at any time, really, to see what the trauma they'd had in any psychological terms. So it, it can change. We can do things too quickly, too early, as in psychological debriefing, but then we can also do things too late when people then developed PTSD and we wish we'd intervened early. So it, it's just not easy, but I still think it works a lot better where justice has been established, where some form of narrative has been established that most people can agree on. Um, and, and every example you've been using so far has been where that clearly has not happened and may not happen. Uh, Rachel, you want to get in there, don't you? Yeah, just just a, a quick one on that. I, I absolutely agree. Um, but I think part of the problem is also that whatever the, the, the catharsis or the re-traumatizing of these truth-telling mm. processes, um, they're not necessarily focused on, on justice for the future and, and addressing the deep-rooted inequalities and exclusion and, and, and the root causes of conflict, unequal access to power. And, and so if you have these processes that are divorced from broader transformation within the societies, and I think you can have truth-telling and, and storytelling in, in many different ways. We, we do a lot of that in the caucuses, long, long, long way away from any form of agreed notion of when the past became the past or any sort of legal framework uh, within which to have those processes, but just individuals gathering documents, gathering stories, uh, putting together a, a really big mosaic, as it were, of the different experiences mm. that have been there. That process and talking about it can be a, a, a hugely important element of starting to not, not rebuild relationships, but, but forge new relationships and, and learn to understand where the, the other people are, are coming from. So that, that, I think, is a given. But without the broader structural systemic change that, that alters then these these um, uh, injustices that 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 carry on over generations, it's very hard for individuals, I think, to feel that they that they really have access to justice or that they're somehow able to to put what happened to them behind them. What what about Siri? Let's talk about the priority there. You talked about the need for justice. Um, but at a time when the man who's seen as the, the greatest perpetrator there is is still in office, uh, it's really going to be very difficult, isn't it? When you talk to your Syrian family and friends, how do you assess the future of the country and of the people who've suffered so much? Yeah, like, to be very honest, we don't really talk about that yet we still in the in the level when we are still thinking about now about what like is still happening until today just like in the past two uh like couple of days there was like thousands of pictures who are flooding between all the syrian people which is these are uh, photos which it was like old photos like five years ago but until today there's still families who are fighting their beloveds through this, the, pictures. this is the photographer who got out of Syria with 55,000 yeah. images of torture and death, uh, which yeah. have now, and he's now in fact given his, his, his code name to this new sanctions act, which the US has brought in. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, like just in this two days, I don't know how, like so many people, they was, like no one can, is able like to go through these pictures to the end and so many families i just find out in the morning around like four or five of my friends who like they found their families or one of their families in, inside these pictures so it's i don't know really like it's very hard to move on and think about next and think about the future and you know like sometimes you just doesn't know if you are doing the right things or not but you just try to like find some peace for individuals through this like madness and try try sometimes to do like even if it's very small step if it's very like simple things maybe it will not change any anything on the ground but it will make someone who's have like some suffering or something to feel a little bit better you feel sometimes that it's just it's enough for now what's happening is like 
bigger than all of us, but also if we don't do as individuals, and that's what actually Rachel said was something very important, as individuals just to keep try tracking these things and find any documents, find all these witnesses, and we don't know when we'll, we will use this. It's also very frustrating how much is hard, you know, to look at even the, like to think just about the result of this justice process. But just for now, it's something we need just to, to think about and not really be um, like very more for the, for the future. It's your film. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, is your film part of that process for, you know, wider civil society, if you like? Uh, yeah. That process of trying to, well, get to grips with what's still happening and thinking of uh, a way forward. Yeah, of course, like I'm trying to do that and focus on this specifically, but also on the other hand, as as much important is it for make people to be aware of what happened and of what's happening right now. But also like we, um, for, for me, for example, I'm, we're trying to build a case against uh, Russia and the Assad regime of bombing hospitals. And I have some evidence. I know witnesses. I know people who lived through <coughs> that, that experience. And just like to think now about, I don't know how long this will take, but it's very important to start and to keep uh, like making people understand that we don't know what the result, maybe it will be like totally um, out of what we really want, but it's very important to start this at least. You know, Simon, this this whole enterprise by the Imperial War Museum is uh, time to coincide with the 75th anniversary of VE Day. And of course, the Second World War was this appalling, traumatic episode of, of slaughter. But at the end, there was a moment when people could say, well, it's over. <clears throat> One side has been utterly destroyed and the other side, the other guys have won. Uh, do you need to have to, to be able to to move on into peace, to have that May 1945 moment? Uh, because the, the problem with a lot of conflicts is they don't actually end as decisively as that one ends. Uh, and as a result, the healing, the change doesn't take place. The First World War didn't end as decisively and sort of continued right on forward. So, so well, in the absence of that, what do you do? Well, well, first of all, again, we, we you know, you, you slipped into a, a, a somewhat British American narrative. Of course, the war did end on V Day and VJ Day, but actually the Second World War most certainly didn't end if you go out to the bloodlands in the East, far from it. Uh, and in some areas, it actually got worse for many, many years. So it's not quite that straightforward. Um, but if you do have an ending, that certainly helps, there's no question. And then you can start to see the different complexities of people's reactions and, and both the civilians and the veterans. And you, you and again, I mean, it's a fascinating subject. And I've just been reading a thesis of someone from uh, Leningrad, uh, Petersburg, uh, writing on the, re the return of the war veterans back to Leningrad um, at the end of the siege where you had a completely different narrative to the normal narrative we have, the veterans coming home with their traumas. There, the veterans weren't very well received because the civilians had a far worse traumas than even they had had, if that was possible, and indeed it was. So it's never a simple thing, but you can make some kind of vague generalizations that really do go back to where I started with the Iliad and the Odyssey, that most people come back from war differently. Um, for some, it's the best time of their life, and life is never the same again. Everything after that is dull and monochromic, and they spend their time trying to recapture that sense of camaraderie, excitement, um, being different, uh, etc. Others, it's been a disaster, and people like me may end up seeing some of them for years and years to help them get over, particularly where it is guilt and shame. Um, where they've had what we sometimes call moral injury. The, the Dutch peacekeepers at Srebrenica in the former Yugoslavia had a horrific time um, because of what they'd seen, what they'd done, and what they hadn't done, and had very long-term psychological consequences. So it, it's about what happens in there. And then finally, to go back to what you were just saying, it's also about inequalities that they come back to in society. If you come back to a society where you are discriminated against or you have unequal access to healthcare, it's happened in the US with Vietnam and issues like that. 
um, you can also get com com complexities developing over time. So it's about what happens in the war, but it's also about the societies you return to and the kind of future that you foresee for yourselves and your families. The one thing it's, it's not is boring. It's always unbelievably interesting and making generalizations is always difficult, even though I've just made one. Well, that's the good thing about these discussions. We can do a lot of generalizing if we if we need to. Uh, we need to start pulling this just to an end right now. But so what I'd like all of you to try to do, and I know there's some, another point you wanted to make, Rachel, I could tell from your body language there, so you can as well if you like. Um, but the, the title of this series is Reimagining Victory. So Rachel, in your you know your final remarks and just a couple of minutes each from both of you would be from all of you would be great um how would you how what does that that phrase does it mean anything to you reimagining victory and also build that in with what you were going to how you responded well to i i actually had a question for both simon and wad and if we're out of time Go then on, i'll, I'll no, no, hold do it, on. Do it, do no it. i was just i i was reflecting on um uh, actually, having watched your film, Ward, which I watched over the weekend and which has really stayed with me and thinking about what what life will be for Sama when she's adult. And um, and what you were saying, Simon, about Germany, even, you know, something we herald as a kind of success story in a way. But I have peers in Germany who grew up with this um, this sense of guilt and responsibility for what had happened that, that mm. has shaped their lives and 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 so what is is there anything that can be done kind of at this point of a conflict like syria to try to put things in place to to make this collective trauma that carries on over generations somehow more bearable or, or, or to, to to find ways of 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 building new possibilities out of this total devastation what? that that was my question no, it's for simon of course not for me i mean the last one on earth could know what what can we do come on then simon what about you then i mean i don't i mean honestly rachel i don't know the answer to that question i i really don't i think it's what you were saying about the needs but eventually some leaders will will appear with courage eventually um, you know, the, first of all, telling narratives, different narratives in the same room uh, can help. I, I listened in Lithuania to uh, 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 an American psychodrama who does psychodrama uh, and told very powerful stories in parts of the world of getting people to act out in, in, a, in a theatrical way um, with, with the other side, whatever they may be, um, in, a, in a kind of dramatic uh, environment. Of drama, of literally drama in the true sense of the word drama. We've seen very powerful as well. There are millions of ways of telling those stories. And when they are told together, I, I'm quite happy to think that's far more important than anything a mere psychiatrist can do. Um, but I go back to the other thing. Again, I, I think we have some agreement on, even if justice doesn't help, it, it's still a starting point. You have to somehow re-establish that you have to get, you have to be safe before you can do anything. The war has to finish, and there has to be some reinstatement of some justice for people, and some attempt to look at, as you've just said, that the the um, you know the, the the misdeeds are still not there, even even in the structure of society, even if the evil isn't still happening. Nevertheless, if you go around the Republic of Serbia, as we've all done. You don't get a sense that society's changed very much. You really don't. Uh, Wad, well, just some closing remarks from you. <clears throat> this series is called Reimagining Victory, but you know, I guess one of the problems in Syria is that there's no victory for anybody at the moment. Ah, uh, yes, but at the same time, like I'm, um, like just uh, a quick scene come to my mind when I heard this was something um like we 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 were together in the at the university when we had like very huge demonstration and it started with six people and then at last was like literally over 5000 people um i just when i heard this like reimagining uh, re victory i it's come back to me to that point when we were in the street chanting for our 
uh, rights and looking just for a future, like it can be more colorful than that day. Uh, the demonstration today in Syria with like very little, few people, but we knew the risk that they are putting themselves in. And after like the Assad regime set, set up this example of what happened if you stood against the regime and they just destroyed the whole picture of what they tried to paint for like nine years. I think that's what for me reimagining victory will be. That's very powerful. Good place to end. <clears throat> Rachel Simon, well, thank you so much for taking part in this uh, very interesting discussion for the Imperial War Museum. Thank you so much.